it's I don't even you know what I just don't care. <laughs> so uh, all right, you it's ready? It's eleven. I, I've already got the recording going, so we're now we're now in full recording mode. So I'll, I'm going to kick this thing off. Um, all right, everybody, thank you so much for attending. Uh, my name is John Strand, and joining me is Sierra. And Sierra will be taking the questions and asking them. So if it sounds like Sierra is asking a ton of questions, that's because she is. She's kind of your conduit, your channel, if you will, uh, for questions on this webcast. And uh, I really appreciate you guys coming and hanging out. I always get a little bit nervous um, with these webcasts whenever they're not highly technical and they're dealing with these types of things. But these are important. I'll talk more about that a little bit later. But I'm so glad that you can make it, whether or not you're here live or whether or not you're viewing the recording is perfectly cool. Um, I would also like to draw your attention to this. It is brought to you by Wild West Hack and Fest. It is, without a doubt, the best Hack and Fest in the West. And I would say personally, one of the top two, at least top two security conferences in South Dakota. Um, at a minimum, a and the game. reason why it's the first one, so um, we no, are no, no. There's, that there's Dakota Con. There's Dakota no, Con. Dakota I mean, Con does a good job. Well, so we're oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. going to be. We're, we're confident it's going to be the within the top two. Um, so here's the people that we have. We have Casey Smith, who you've heard me talk about just ridiculous, ridiculous amount of time on these webs on these webcasts. Uh, Matt Nelson, Jonathan Ham, Bo Bolock, of course, uh, Chris Gates, which is going to be awesome, and uh, Chris Nickerson, which is going to be. A, a train wreck. I guarantee you anything that Nickerson is doing with Gates is going to be a train wreck. Um, Darren isn't going to make it from Hack 5, uh, although I'm going to try to put some pressure on him. Dave Kennedy is company, coming. Deviant uh, from Tool and you know all kinds of lock picking stuff. James Lee, or you guys might know him as Egypt. Johnny Long, who I have to twist his arm again to get out here. He agreed and he's kind of hemming and hawing. Kevin Johnson, Larry Pashi. Paul Zadorian, Rob Fuller, and Mubix, and Robin Wood, also known as DigiNinja, and then we also have our very own Sally from BHIS. So we have an amazing uh, little conference coming up, and it's out here in Deadwood, South Dakota. So please, please come check it out. It's going to be a very, very good time. You guys can get your tickets there at WildWestHackingFest.com, and uh, this is this awesome picture of me. And I want to show you guys something that, that Sierra did. So. Like, first I thought that this was kind of like a joke, right? So Sierra put my face on a cowboy, and uh, my camera is not working. There we go. And uh, then she went and she made stickers. Like, look, this, these are actual stickers here that you, can, that you can peel off on, on a sticker sheet. So if you see anybody presenting at a con uh, between now and Wild West Tech and Fest, you can swing by. We have a bunch of these sticker sheets, and you can get them. They go really, really, really fast because they're just, they're just horrifying. So check out the sticker sheets because everyone loves stickers uh, for all the different types of conferences that are out there. So, so yep, so Wild West Hack and Fest, come check us out. It's going to be a great time. It's at the end of October, or as I like to say, Rocktober. There's a little bit of contention at BHIS, just so you guys know. Um, Sierra wants to get like a crazy Western band to come and play. I want to get a crazy psychedelic polka band to play. So we're going to try to have a night where there's a party that's going to have beer and brats and some type of wild crazy music still yet to be determined. As I said, this is not technical today, um, which believe it or not, I think is probably one of the more important types of webcasts that we do. I think many times in security, we get so hung up on being technical in absolutely everything at Security Weekly and a lot of our webcasts and some, most of our blogs at BHIS that we lose sight of what actually moves things, what actually creates some type of change in an organization. It's okay. We can't do tech all the time. We want to focus on some things that will help advance security within your organization. And I'm not going to try to like you know dance around the, the, the critical point. We're going to be using fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And this is, you know, a lot of people freak out about that, but realistically, whenever you're looking at computer security, there's a tremendous amount of FUD out there. And fear, uncertainty, and doubt are not necessarily bad things, per se, if you're using them correctly. If there's fear and uncertainty and doubt within your organization, it is your responsibility to kind of go and reduce the fear, to reduce the uncertainty, and reduce the doubt associated with computer security. And that 
kind of gets into the Peter Parker principle, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. So there's a tremendous amount of responsibility in dealing with FUD. But instead of just jumping and saying fear, uncertainty, and doubt is a bad thing, we can use that effectively. And I think that the, you know, the ransomware and insurance angle is something that is very, very, very important for all of us. So when I started doing this uh, presentation, I, I started writing up some slides in a notepad document. And I kind of outlined my slides in notepad, which clearly doesn't have spell check. And I um, just try to get all my thoughts on, on kind of on paper, right? And then I move things around, I shift things around, and I, was, I had this whole entire thing that was like, what causes effective change in organizations? And it started to sound really crappy. It started to sound like a motivational uh, poster, you know, teamwork is what's absolutely essential for solid change. You must be the change you wish to be within your organization. Um, you know, you gotta have passion and I, I think that a lot of these, anytime anyone says these motivational phrases, I always see, what's that, uh, that god-awful motivational speaker, uh, Tim Robbins, um, and striking a very handsome pose and flashing a thousand-watt smile after he says things. And I didn't want it to come across like that. Um, I wanted it to be more realistic insofar as what we see when we're testing and we're working with organizations. So I'm going to start by saying what does not work whenever you're trying to impact change with an organization. Um, so first and foremost, compliance. Compliance does not work as a primary motivator for change in an organization. Now there's a lot of people that will argue this point. They say that compliance is better than nothing. That's, that's fine, I, I don't care. I, I think that that's wrong and I'll explain why that's wrong here in just a little bit. But if you look at compliance as the first mover in an organization, because there's a document out there that says that you have to do something, Many times compliance isn't effective because a lot of times the teeth associated with compliance is removed. Uh, I'll give you an example. If you got HIPAA, for the longest time, HIPAA was a compliance document with very little teeth associated with it. Now that is changing a little bit. Uh, there are some situations where HIPAA has actually been enforced and there's been some fines levied against organizations. But the fines are relatively small. If you look at a lot of the compliance fines that are out there, like $100,000, they're like X bank or not bank, the X hospital was fined $150,000 for HIPAA violations. That sounds hideous. And for most human beings it is because we immediately relate that back to what we consider to be a lot of money. Um, if we look at $150,000, $250,000, we're like, oh my God, that's a crap ton of money. But if you're a bank or you're a healthcare organization or you're a hospital, uh, some type of financial trading organization, that's chump change. Um, that's not even a rounding error uh, for most of their financial documents that they deal with. So when you're looking at those types of fines, it's good for human beings and general individuals that work every day to look at that and say, well, that shows them. But for most organizations, it actually doesn't have any impact uh, whatsoever. So that compliance becomes something that you pay lip service to. If your overall risk associated with not being compliant with HIPAA is like $150,000, $200,000 or $300,000, then it becomes very easy to do something called meeting the absolute minimum. And that's what a lot of organizations look for whenever compliance exists. They're like, what do we have to do to meet the absolute minimum? And they do that for a couple of reasons. They do that because they can, because they, you know, if they meet the checkbox, that's great. But then the other thing is the risk isn't that great to them if they are not compliant. And that is a horrifying concept because their biggest risk, that is perceived risk, is not being compliant and an auditor slapping them with a the fine. That's their biggest concern, folks. And when you compare that risk of $150,000, $200,000 fine with how expensive it can be to actually get compliant in the first place, then it becomes this trade-off to try to do as little as you po possibly can. Because even if you do get slapped with a fine, it's still not that much at the end of the day. Now, compliance can be great as a guidance document. If you have an organization that desperately wants to get secure and they want to do better, they can use that as, a, as kind of a guide way to get better. That would be like the SANS 20 critical controls, the NIST 853, which I think is coming up on revision four. You have compliance documents that are excellent once an organization has made a decision and a commitment to do good security and try to get things done correctly. But it's an extremely, extremely poor starting point in an organization to try to implement change and do security the right way. What actually does drive change? And I really wish that uh, Jack Daniel would be on, the, on, on this today. Um, and I didn't invite him. The dude's really, really, really busy. Um, and 
The reason why is Jack is one of the best people out there that talks about like no BS what actually causes organizations to move. And one of the things that we talk about a lot is, you know, what is regulation? What is compliance? Is it actually effective? Is it not effective? If you have uh, CAFE standards, if you have seatbelt standards, if you have airbag standards, going back and looking historically and trying to see what actually changes things historically for safety and engineering, you have compliance standards and things like that, but usually there's something else that is a motivating factor that actually pushes it. So that's why I think ransomware is so important because ransomware I have not seen anything in the security industry that has pushed the needle further into trying to secure organizations than ransomware. And, and let me explain why. If you're talking about a compliance, uh, kind of a compliance objective in an organization, and you're trying to implement security in an organization, you have this ephemeral risk, you have this attack vector, you have this threat actor out there, and usually the threat actor that you're the most afraid of is the auditor coming in and finding out that you're not compliant which at the end of the day isn't all that big of a threat because you're going to get a small fine, slap your hand, you move on. If you're trying to defend yourself up until ransomware took off against a hacker, you started putting this idea in your head as far as what a hacker looked like. And you always came up with this idea of a hacker in a hoodie, a kid in their parents' basement, um, wearing lots of black, and you, you kind of downplayed you know, somebody that was socially maladjusted, and you kind of downplayed the overall threat as part of that risk factor. However, ransomware changed that. And the reason why is it's something we've been talking about in these webcasts for years. The reason why it changed that is whenever you learn something as a human being, uh, like if you find out that the frying pan is hot, usually you find out that the frying pan is hot by actually touching the frying pan. Um, you sizzle your hand, it's an immediate painful response to touching the frying pan, and you learn not to do that again. And a lot of attacks or malware spreading, it would kind of sit on your system, it would fester for an extended period of time, and you wouldn't know it was there for a long period of time, and it wouldn't cause immediate damage, but ransomware changed all that. It was an immediate, visceral touching of the frying pan and learning that the frying pan was hot. Immediate and painful. And it was really a beacon of how much more damage attackers could actually do. If you look at ransomware, ransomware, they hit a system, they start encrypting files, they pivot to other systems and shares and start encrypting files. That's, that's pretty bad. But I, I think that a lot of security teams can point to that and they could say this could be much worse. Rather than just the bad guys encrypting files on a hard drive or encrypting files on a server, they could have lingered on our system, they could have exfiltrated social security numbers, they could have exfiltrated PHI, PII, um, they could have done stock market manipulation, they could have done any number of different things. The only thing they did was encrypt the files, put up a timer and request uh, Bitcoin to pay to get your files back. And it's kind of a really, to be honest, in a lot of situations, a cheap learning experiment. In many ways, more effective than penetration tests. And further, we've gotten a lot of work out of ransomware. People get hit by ransomware and they're like, we want to make sure this doesn't happen again. How can we make sure that we're a little bit better in security? So another kind of tale about making changes. Uh, uh, CJ Cox, the COO of BHIS and I, we came from Department of Defense. Um, intelligence community. And we would work on these secu on security on these very large intelligence projects. And, uh, you know, working for the NSA, NRO, CIA, all these different organizations. And while these products were being built, while these software packages were being built, we would try to bake security in at the very beginning and work security all the way through. And then we get tremendous pushback from the project managers. We would get tremendous pushback from the developers many times whenever we would want to have a security kind of architecture component implemented. They would say it's too expensive, we can't do that, we'll have to refactor, this is a problem, we can't do that. They would fight us and 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 many times we would lose. And they would keep on coming back and they would say, well, you know, this is this is a this is up to interpretation for the DSCID 6.3 or the risk management framework or DICAP or DITSCAP or whatever military framework was being used, and they would constantly push back because it could be interpreted a variety of different ways. But then judgment day would come. And they would have an auditor from the designated accrediting authority or the program accrediting authority. They would show up and the customer would say, this is a category one finding. This product can't go live. We can't move to the next gate. You do not get paid, Northrop Grumman, unless this category one finding is addressed. And it's amazing to me how something that went from this nebulous contractual compliance idea became concrete as soon as millions of dollars were held up as part of that contract. The point is when the pain is immediate and the pain is visceral, 
it is something that people can get behind. They can learn from that much more than these obscure learning objectives uh, for, you know, well, we got to do compliance, talk about things nebulous. If it's immediate and painful, you learned a valuable lesson very, very, very quickly. These are things that we constantly hear. Now, one of the things I've learned over the years, uh, you know, pen testing at BHIS, I spent a lot of time lately thinking that security is getting better. And I, I talk to a lot of people in the industry and it turns out it's not getting better. It's just that it seems like in our universe, I like to call it the SANS Security Weekly Universe, which is a small subset of the overall security universe and the IT universe is much, much, much larger. But in our little small section of the universe, it appears that things are getting better. Um, we don't get as many customers that say stuff like, we can just accept the risks. I read this as part of my CISSP training. If you look at older CISSP training, they say you can address the risk, you can defer the risk. Um, and I, I love deferring the risk or accepting the risk because there was always a latent assumption that by deferring the risk or handing the risk off to an insurance company, that that would be an adequate risk control. Um, so let's say that you have a vulnerability and you're like, ah, that's really expensive. We've got cyber insurance. We're deferring the insurance to someone or deferring the risk to our insurance company. And that's, that's crap. And I'll talk about why that's crap here in just a little bit. Another thing we hear is we're not a big target. Why would, why, who would want to hack us? We're, we're small. And I think once again, if we go back to ransomware, um, we've seen organizations get hit at county levels, we've seen them at city levels, we've seen small banks get hit, and for a lot of these organizations it's pretty devastating, especially these really small organizations, especially small banks. There's been a number of situations where small banks have been hit, and that really impacts their reputation within the community if there is a cyber breach and ransomware attack in these small organizations. But historically, most of these small organizations have been doing the absolute minimum they can do in computer security. And also, unfortunately, I'm, I'm aware that for many of these small banks, it, it, they just don't have the funding that like a Bank of America or Citigroup or J.P. Morgan Chase has. And the last thing that we would hear is we have insurance. And this becomes especially problematic for a couple of different reasons. Basically, it is an organization stating that they understand that there's a problem. And many times when we pen test, they'll say, we understand, BHIS, that you guys found a way that you could break into our organization. You found a way through our website to basically hijack other people's accounts. You found something that could be truly devastating to 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 way we run our business, could actually put us out of business. And they will say things like, well, we have insurance. And that becomes the kind of gloss over. And the reason why this is problematic is insurance companies aren't going to allow that to happen. And then the other reason is it's been documented that you were made aware of that security vulnerability and you intentionally decided not to address that vulnerability. And that'll become even more problematic should that vulnerability or actually any vulnerability be exploited if it shows that you have a systematic approach of ignoring security vulnerabilities in your organization, it's going to create issues should you ever call your insurance company and try to cash in on that, on that claim. So insurance. There are so many different types of insurance. Uh, we know this very well at BHIS uh, we, there, because it, it seems almost like on a weekly basis, uh, not a weekly basis, say a monthly basis, we have someone who shows up and says, we need to have X type of insurance with X type of dollar amounts. And a lot of times for pen testing, the insurance requirements are ridiculous. Like they'll be like, well, you need to have at least $20 million of cyber liabilities, errors and emission, an umbrella policy, auto policy must be at least $2 million. They'll list out all of these crazy insurance requirements. And if we go to our insurance company and we're like, hey, we need this type of insurance, many times the insurance company gets very nervous and, and justifiably so. And they start asking questions like, what are you doing? Oh, we're pen testing a very small bank that maybe has $20 million dollars in, in assets that they're managing and they're like why why do you need you know 10 million insurance policy for that and a lot of times these insurance policies are way out of whack and we negotiate them down once they understand the industry requirements for things like PCI they tend to feel a little bit better because we have significantly more than just the base required for PCI but the other problem you run into is the definitions of insurance you'll have cyber crime insurance that's if you get hacked, right? So cybercrime is if your organization is compromised, um, then they will cover you because you got hacked. And what's interesting about cybercrime is 
you know, they start asking questions like, do you always use antivirus? And we're like, no. Um, we do pen testing. We create viruses. And it really gets horribly confusing for a lot of insurance companies when we're trying to explain what we do. Um, whenever you talk about cybercrime and you're like, no, 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 we commit cybercrime type activities, but we do so legitimately under contract, insurance companies get very, very nervous. It's getting better. Um, it used to be that organizations, insurance companies had no idea whatsoever um, what, 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 what we did. And what's interesting now, and I'll show you some insurance requirements, I think uh, they're from Philadelphia, where they actually require a third-party audit of security controls. So many times what we do when we're talking with companies, if they start getting confused, it's like, well, you guys are doing the exact same thing. It's actually in your insurance document requirements that security tests will be done. That's what we do. We're the third party that does the security testing requirements in your requirements for insurance. And they tend to get better about it. Errors and omissions, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but errors and omissions is kind of general insurance for quality of work. If you screw up while you're working on something like software or a penetration test, you need to have errors and omissions. And many times errors and omissions is fine. You don't need anything other than errors and omissions, but sometimes they'll want errors and omissions and cybercrime. And then there'll be cyber liability, which also is like if we're doing work and we end up impacting another organization through our activities, then we need to have cyber liability. Then you have employee threat, theft, and then you have commercial dishonesty. I'm not going to go through every single one of these insurance documents because we've gone through them and it's painful, but I'm going to go through some of the highlights that are required. Oftentimes, different insurance companies will have different names for the exact same type of coverage, or there'll be a, a very slight difference in the wording, and then lawyers start getting involved. But it creates a ton of confusion whenever people are talking about the different types of insurance that you need to have to effectively have insurance for cybersecurity-related events. But they can come under a number of different names. Also, requirements. So yeah, we have a lot of insurance at BHIS, and that, and we should. I'm not complaining and saying that we absolutely should know that we're being fairly unfairly targeted. It is absolutely essential that any testing firm you have have a sufficient amount of insurance for what they're going to do, because PCI and every customer under the sun, they all want different things, and that's fine, so it goes. The requirements can seem vague when we're talking about security, and they're vague for a reason, and I'm going to get to that here in just a couple of slides. So let's go through some of the insurance document requirements. I don't want to go through absolutely all of them because that's painful, but I want to go through some highlights. So this is from, I believe it's from Philadelphia's insurance uh, documentation. Whenever you're starting to set up cyber insurance, they'll ask you these questions, and over on the right-hand side, there'll be check boxes, yes, no. One, do you have a firewall? Um, I think that that's hilarious because that kind of shows some of the old-school mentality thinking um, that, that is, in fact, the very first question that they ask in cyber liability insurance. And you know what? Thinking about it, yeah, it's probably a good idea. If an organization doesn't even have a firewall, why bother going through the rest of these questions? Because if they don't have a firewall, that's a really great acid test to see if they have any level of computer security. Do you require information technology department or outsource third-party vendors to adhere to software update process, including software patches and antivirus software definition upgrades? That's very, very basic. But I'm going to talk about this in a little bit. You should look at that as a potential loophole. Um, not necessarily for you, who's trying to get insurance, but for the insurance companies. And the reason why is I asked a question on Twitter a while ago, what is your patch uh, success deployment percentage? And for many organizations you're looking at, that have it down really well, it's between 80 and 85% for Microsoft patches. For third party patches, it's much, much, much worse. And that becomes a possible loophole. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later. But yeah, do you have a firewall? Do you patch your systems? The next big one I want to call out is, of course, you have virus protection. Do you use standard configuration for firewalls, routers, and operating systems? Well, when you're talking about standard configurations, this will become important for you a little bit later in this presentation. There's no one in legal. There's no one even in the insurance company. There's no one in your insurance department if your organization is that big that is actually going to identify and know what a standard configuration actually is for a firewall or a router, what a standard configuration would be. Once again, that's up for a high-level interpretation. Our system backup and recovery procedures tested for all mission-critical systems and performed at least annually. Now, what's interesting about this one is this actually ties directly into ransomware and many times whether or not insurance companies will pay out. 
Because many times when you're hit by ransomware and encrypts files, and systems go down, you know, your users lose access to their workstations, they may encrypt files on file servers and so on, and you may have to rebuild those from scratch, and it can be very, very painful. And a lot of organizations just flat out don't have backup and restoration processes in place. And ransomware is easy to deal with if you have solid backup and restoration. It's basically like, oh, you lost today's work, we're blowing away your system, we're restoring it from backup, we're storing your data from backup. Please don't click on random links from strangers and download software. Now that's interesting because if you get hit by a ransomware attack, and it actually encrypts entire servers, you lose backups, you lose lots of money, it becomes very easy for them to say, you checked yes on this item, and now you're claiming $10 million in damages, and it's very, very clear from the fact that you got hit by a ransomware and it was successful, that you did not have backup and recovery procedures in place. And that is absolutely a point where they can not pay out. Once again, do you have a program in place to periodically test your data security controls? Now that can be a self-assessment. If your organization is doing vulnerability assessments on a regular basis, um, then you're kind of in trouble. And this also becomes problematic because many, many, many smaller organizations don't have dedicated security teams and many of them don't even have IT teams. That's one of the things we're learning with researching this webcast is a lot of small banks, they outsource their IT to a local mom and pop IT shop. And yeah, are they actually doing security assessments on somewhat a regular basis for the security controls? That's going to be a cost for some smaller organizations. And then the big one is 14. Have you undergone enough information security or privacy compliance evaluation? If yes, identify who performed the evaluation, the data was performed, and the type of evaluation, and this is important, and the results. And the results. Now, please understand that the vast majority of time, the insurance company is simply going to take that third party assessment and they're simply just going to put it away in a file. And they're not going to, they'll look at it, make sure it's there. Yep, it's ran by a company, you know, BHIS, Secure Ideas, Trusted Sec, InGuardians, whoever. All right, fine, we move on. However, when there is a breach, I guarantee you, if it ever goes to a legal court situation, they are going to have that reviewed. And if you're talking about millions of dollars, it is not just going to be reviewed by the insurance company or their attorneys. It is going to be reviewed by expert witnesses. They're going to be calling in security firms who are very, very good at what they do to look at that report, analyze how well that test was done, and make a determination on the validity and the quality of the testing results. I know this because it's come up in a number of situations. I've reviewed some reports from some other security companies as part of um, some legal cases. None of them actually went to court. Something usually goes very, very, very wrong if it ever goes to court. But many of these are just Nessus scans. You basically have a Nessus scan, you send it through Dratus, and you output a report. That is not a solid security evaluation. In fact, it becomes very easy. Just give you an example on how this would go. If you have a company that shows up and runs a Nessus vulnerability scan, and you're a financial institution. I'll just stick on that theme. And they just run a vulnerability scan, give you the results, and that is the test. If you look at PCI 3.0 and greater, they made it very, very, very clear that that is not a penetration test. That is not a segmentation test. So it becomes easy for me as somebody that may be doing expert witness work to say that this particular type of testing was not done in compliance with PCI DSS standards and I can list out the standards and it shows that you are not in compliance with what you checked on your insurance form. Why does it make it very easy for me to say that? Because if you look at a lot of insurance documents, they actually list out what compliance framework you're under. Are you associated with PCI DSS? Are you associated with Graham Leach Blaley? Are you associated with HIPAA? And if you check that, if you say we are a bank, check, we are, com we are compliant with PCI DSS, then any third party assessment that is done up for section 14 
any third party assessment is done also has to be done in compliance with those compliance standards, whether it's Grand Leach Blaley, PCI, DSS, HIPAA, and also on some newer insurance uh, documents, this is just one of them, they actually list out a whole bunch more framework, whether you're talking about credit union security standards, um, whether you're dealing with uh, NIST 853 framework, we've even seen some that are the SANS 20 critical control frameworks and so on. And that's one of the reasons why we adhere to the SANS 20 critical controls is because it's cross-mapped to these other frameworks that are out there. And that makes it a lot easier for us to say we've complied with this, we're in compliance with a number of those different things as well. Um, another one is, do you have current enterprise-wide network information security policies that applies to employees, independent contractors, third-party vendors? Yes. Um, now, many, many, many insurance companies uh, for number five will actually request a copy of all of your policies. And we have seen insurance companies lately that not only do they look to see that these policies exist, they actually go one step further. They actually go through and check to make sure that those policies have some key provisions, like user awareness training. Um, they'll make sure that you actually have something for internal segmentation. They're getting a lot smarter. And the reason why they're doing this, just so you know, is insurance companies, they want to reduce the likelihood that you get compromised. And the reason why they want to do that is because then they don't have to pay out. Paying out is bad. Having you on that gravy train for as long as possible is good. And also insurance companies, they don't have to deal with all the politics in your organization, all the crap that goes around with trying to implement any mediocre of security that you want. Why? Because they basically will give you insurance or they're not going to give you insurance. End of story. They're not going to sit there and argue what a compliance requirement says. They basically become the end law for what that compliance requirement actually means when it says internal segmentation, when it means third party evaluations. So they're getting a lot better. Insurance companies are finding out that if they have a little bit of security know-how at the beginning of actually establishing insurance for their customers, it saves them a tremendous amount of money on the back end. Does your company have a formal privacy policy that has been approved by legal counsel? Uh, once again, privacy policies, that's a huge thicket of how you have segmentation, how you grant access to different files, who has access to what, what types of controls you have as well. So they're not all that detailed, right? I mean, they'll give you some pointers and they'll say, you should, you know, are you in compliance with PCI DSS? And that's somewhat intentional. They want you to be as compliant as possible, but they don't want to give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to secure your environment because there's already compliance documentation that's out there that they can basically have you check and say, yeah, we're HIPAA, yeah, we're Graham Leach Blightly, yeah, we are uh, PCI DSS, whatever. The, the issue is with being incredibly detailed. Um, if they were incredibly detailed, then people could quote unquote start meeting just the minimum and then it would get into very legal thorny issues about whether or not they could or should pay out. The point of this is if you look at this and say it's vague and we can meet the minimum, understand that loophole can go both ways. Sure, you can fudge the requirements, but the insurance companies can also use that ambiguity to not pay. And they have done that a number of times. Let's go through an example. Uh, this is just one case. There's a whole bunch um, on this risk management website. But CNA Financial Group has a, uh, as an insurance company. Um, that basically uh, it's called I think Columbia and Cottage Health uh, had a number of uh, sensitive documents that were posted on an anonymous FTP server. There was no security whatsoever, it wasn't was an FTP server, it was a website. You would simply just surf to it and then you could gain access to those documents. Now the reason why I, I bring this particular case up is one, we have existing case law associated with it, number one. Number two, the other reason why it's really important is this is one simple, stupid mistake. And what I mean by that simple, stupid mistake is the case didn't go into a lot of detail about all of the other things that this company was doing to try to secure their environment. It's just one simple, stupid mistake. Somebody put on one of their public-facing web servers a whole bunch of health records that was found out, and they basically were slapped with some massive fines associated with it. So 32,500 32, 32, confidential medical records, okay? So that's a lot of records uh, for that particular organization, but to be honest, in the grand scheme of things, it's not even large enough to make a blip on the radar anymore for news. Also over here, like I just pulled this today, there's a number of other um, stories, no insurance payout for real estate brokers. Um, there's tons and tons of scenarios where organizations have been breached, they went to their insurance company, and their insurance company flat out refused 
refused to pay because they didn't meet minimum required practices. All right. Now, what's interesting about that is that minimum required practices for this particular insurance, it's a little bit less detailed than the insurance document I showed you above. Um, like I said, they just made a mistake. Permitted anonymous user access, thereby allowing electronic personal information to become publicly available via Google's internet search engine. And they said that they failed to regularly check and maintain security patches on its system. And it's failed to regularly reassess its information security exposure and enhance risk controls. It's failed to have the system in place to detect unauthorized access or attempts to access sensitive information stored on its servers and its failure to control and track all changes to its network to ensure it remains secure among other things. So the issue with this is they made one mistake. Okay. Now, if you think that that one mistake seems like you can drive a truck straight through fo failure to follow minimum practices, well, there's some attorneys that actually agree with you, right? You know, when you're talking about those policies and the common cybersecurity policies, this is overly broad and it is highly subject. Uh, su um, Suggest, uh, subjective, right? An insurer could argue that they applied to almost any data breach depending on how they are drafted. And what's important is that's kind of similar to, it's kind of similar to PCI. You know, PCI likes to come out and say, well, there's been no breach associated with an organization that's been PCI compliant because if you are hacked, Ergo, you weren't PCI compliant because if you were compliant, you'd be secure. And that gets into this weird circular argument about quote unquote meeting the minimum and doing the absolute least amount of work possible to actually implement security in your organization. So yeah, an insurer can drive a Mack truck through that and basically say, well, you were hacked, therefore you were not secure, and we only gave insurance to secure organizations. It is absolutely an overly broad statement, but that's intentional. And it's important to use these case studies and to use these stories whenever you're talking to Whenever you're talking to management, whenever you're talking to legal, whenever you're talking to your insurance department, it's important to use these case studies, be able to drive through that we can't just meet the absolute minimum. We need to be able to show where we're exceeding uh, certain controls, where we're implementing these controls. We need to have a vulnerability management program. We need to have a plan of actions and milestones for handling those vulnerabilities. It isn't just something that you basically do all of these things and then congratulations, wave to wand, you're secure. It's basically you need to go a little bit further and it requires you as a security professional in your organization to have a good understanding of like the SANS 20 critical controls, to have a good understanding of PCI DSS, to have a good understanding of HIPAA if it is in fact something that is applicable in your organization. So yeah, the other thing that's interesting about this, using this as a driver for you is we're starting to see a lot more insurance that is being tied together, okay? Um, what does that mean? So right now, uh, we predominantly go through tech insurance, and then tech insurance gets insurance and they shop around to a number of different other insurance companies that are out there that offer the type of insurance Black Hills Information Security needs, and in doing so, we may get different insurance companies for different policies, right? Because we need to have lots and lots and lots of different policies for all these different proposals that we're working with. However, with larger organizations, i.e. bigger than BHIS, which isn't all that hard to do, a lot of times they'll basically bundle all of their insurance together. It's kind of like those those commercials, progressive commercials with flow, where if you start bundling your insurance, your um, your insurance for your vehicles at your company, your insurance if somebody slips out front in front of your business, you you got tons of insurance that is out there. If you start bundling that all together, you start getting better rates because it's all together in one place. And it also makes it easier for your company because you're not working with filling out paperwork and documentation for 15 different companies. You're filling out paperwork and documentation for a company. And a lot of times that makes things easier. So now with cyber insurance, it's becoming something that is a core growth area in many insurance companies. Back in 2007, 2008, when we were starting BHIS, it was very, very hard to find insurance companies and understood what security assessments were or penetration tests were. It was very hard for them to understand the idea of cyber liability. If we get hacked, we want to be able to get insurance for that particular event. Now, insurance companies are seeing dollar signs, you know, ka-ching, and it's now becoming very, very, very lucrative for them to make this a key thing that they can sell. It's part of that quote-unquote fear, uncertainty, and doubt. They're using that as a marketing tool in order to start selling this. And they should be selling this. This should be something that people should have. Like I said, fear, uncertainty, and doubt isn't always bad. It's only bad when people take advantage of it.
And insurance companies, I don't think they're taking advantage of it yet, but it, they definitely are in a position where they could, and I'm sure some companies are. But with all of these cyber attacks that are happening constantly and making the news, it is absolutely something that organizations should have. They should have insurance. And insurance companies are filling that void, and they're making a lot of money off of it. In fact, there's been a number of articles that said over 2016, uh, the cost for cyber liability insurance has gone up 36% because the actuaries are going through and starting to develop more solid numbers insofar as how much of a risk exposure it is for the insurance company to pay out these claims. And as the cost goes up to us, you better believe that insurance companies are looking for reasons to not pay out. Because, I mean, you could say that insurance companies are evil, right? You know, you get this insurance, you pay money on it, and then once you get breached, they're like, well, we're not going to pay. But there has to be a balance, right? There has to be a balance that says, we are not going to pay out for a company that just does the minimum. We are not going to pay out for a bank that has no security program whatsoever. We are not going to pay out for an organization that didn't bother doing patching, that didn't bother doing vulnerability assessments, that didn't bother doing third-party assessments. We're not going to pay out in those situations because they shouldn't have to. They shouldn't. But at the same time, it requires us to do some level of due diligence on our side of the fence to make sure that those types of things don't happen, that we don't get into an argument with an insurance company about whether or not they should be paying out. So all of this is kind of working to your advantage as a security department. As I said, trying to tie this together from the beginning, when we're talking about fear, uncertainty, and doubt, when we're talking about how you can use that effectively in your organization to drive your security program forward, this is your chance. If you are arguing about trying to implement, let's just say some basic firewall rules, or you're trying to implement some basic intrusion detection, or you're trying to buy something like Cisco Firepower devices that implement two things together, you're trying to upgrade your infrastructure from 2010, if you're trying to fight to change these things, if you have products in your organization that are end in life, a lot of these fights in your organization become fights of personality. It becomes a fight between the CFO and the CIO, right? The CFO wants to save money and says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The CIO says, this particular firewall, router, whatever, it's at end of life or has been at an end of life for the past four years. We need to upgrade it. You have this conflict between the two, right? You have a company that insists on running Windows 2000 as their web server infrastructure. There's a number of examples that we have seen over the past 18 months that we've seen some horrendous security decisions made. And they've been made because somebody in management says, it ain't broke, don't fix it, it's not a problem. Who, know, who cares about us? We're too small. So it becomes a fight of personalities. It becomes a fight between you and the people with the money. And by using insurance as a wedge issue and looking at insurance being tied together uh, across your entire organization, it becomes like government pork spending. You have a whole bunch of senators and congressmen that will add in all these little writers to the bill that will specifically support or help their district, bring you know, projects to their district. It has nothing to do with what the bill is, but they're using it in a way to try and they're using it in a way to try to tack on the things that they want to something that people overall absolutely must have. So let's say they have a bill for you know, defense funding or education spending. You know, no one wants to vote against those things, right? as some people do, I suppose, when I'm trying to come up with relatively neutral examples. And by tacking things on to something like, you know, you know, kids with cancer bill, right? Everyone wants to help kids with cancer. By tacking on, well, we're going to have a $5 million project in my specific district, no one wants to vote against that bill, so they're going to vote for it, even though it has some other things tied to it. And you can use that, right? You can basically look at the insurance requirements across the entire organization and say, these are the things that we absolutely must implement in our organization. And this gets into another kind of longer term thing that you need, need to do right now. Um, <laughs> you need to be the source of information security news in your organization. Um, a lot of these are not specific things that need to be, that levers that need to be pulled, right? A, a lot of people think that there's magical incantations to things in life. Like there's a magical incantation of words that you can say to a woman and she'll go out on a date with you. Um, that's crap, right? There's a couple of magical things you can say to managers, like you can use leverage and synergy and synergistic and all these different things and management's going to listen to you. That's not how it works, right? It's not magical incantations. A lot of times it requires a tremendous amount of building trust and relationships and respect in an organization and that's something that may take a while. It's one of those things I've said in multiple different webcasts. I'm going to continue to say it. If you are at your organization 
organization and you're constantly saying, I work with a bunch of idiots, my boss is an idiot, all the other people that are running the organization are complete morons, I hate everybody, the problem isn't everyone, the problem is you. And I know that that's hard for a lot of people because they're like, well, no, really, they're idiots, they're absolute morons, uh, they don't know anything about security. That's not their fault. Really, <laughs> you need to be that guru in the organization. If your boss is getting the information from USA Today, Drudge Report, Huffington Post, then you probably suck at effectively communicating security issues in your organization. You should be holding regular brown bags. You should be sending out maybe little newsletters that says, hey, there's this new phishing attack where people are pretending to send things from Amazon, um, for like the Amazon Echo. Be careful, once again, review the security awareness video to see how, how to identify links that are potentially malicious, malicious. Invite everyone. Everyone may not come, but make it known that you're sharing information and don't get too technical and tell stories, right? You want to be the security explainer in your organization, that you are the person that is going to be the touchstone of information security. And the reason why is because legal management, insurance, and HR are all going to be coming to you for those explanations of what is vague in the organization. Look, what does it mean by having a third party assessment? What does it mean to have a patch management process? What does it mean to implement security baseline minimums? You can use this as leverage. You can use this fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and you can illuminate people. And, and that's, like I said, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt is not bad as long as you're being, you know, the good person and you're trying to give adequate information and trying to give good advice to people in your organization. And there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And I know a lot of you are trying to get projects in place. You're trying to do the best you can in computer security. That's why I don't get mad at the security technicians at Sony or, you know, you know, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase or uh, all these organizations like Target that have been compromised, you can't get mad at them because many of these security people that are out there every single day are fighting constantly against management, fighting constantly against legal, fighting constantly against the finance department to get the bare things that they need to do their jobs. And what I'm hoping that this webcast does is it helps give you another tool to win that argument. Because if you use insurance appropriately, it is no longer a personal argument between individuals. I've said it before, the best way to lose an argument is by arguing. However, if you are arguing with someone, they're like, well, I don't know if we need to actually update our Cisco PIXs from 15 years ago, then you can say, I hear what you're saying, and I understand and acknowledge what you're saying and your problem, it's expensive, the things are still working. However, we do have some compliance requirements for insurance that say we need to have things regularly patched and up to date. These devices are at end of life. We can't patch and update them. And if we have devices that are at end of life or operating systems that are end of life or applications that we can't get patches for, then we're not only not in compliance with these documents over here, we're not in compliance with our own insurance that we told the insurance company that we were doing these things. See, what happens is you're deflecting the argument. It's no longer an argument between you and another individual. It's now an argument between that individual and a document, a compliance document, a legal document, an insurance document. You can then talk to your attorneys and you can be like, you know, explain what does it mean if something isn't receiving patches anymore, how you're not in compliance with this particular part of the document. You become that touchstone and you're fighting fear, uncertainty, and doubt with real information. And that is an incredibly powerful thing. So if nothing comes out of this webcast at all, other than just simply this is another tool to try to fight to get good security in your organization, then this is successful. And that's why these types of webcasts are so incredibly important, because this is something that is missing. Um, I also have a resources slide. Um, for all of the articles that I kind of thought were important. And I, I thought these articles were important because these are the, excuse me, these are the articles that if I was in your situation, these are the articles I would want to read and these are the articles I would want to share with management. Because a lot of these articles highlight how organizations that were not in compliance with their documentation that they signed off on for insurance weren't getting paid once there was a breach. Because once again, I think insurance com companies, in many situations, not all, are justifiably not going to pay out for organizations that are absolutely trying to meet the bare minimum. So I want to say thanks for attending. Um, I got my Twitter handle because you know Twitter is validation for me as a human being. Um, my email address 
uh, my phone number, uh, Security Weekly, Paul couldn't make it today, and also consulting at BlackHillsInfosec.com. We do security stuff, we do pen testing, we do security audits and all that. And uh, the slides are at tinyurl.com, 504extra2. You'll notice that that is a different link than what we have used in the past. Uh, the 504 dash extra, uh, the Dropbox changed the link that it was pointing to, um, so you get a 404 not found. So this one is more, this one shows you right back to the same folder. These slides are there and it's under insurance. If you just short it by date, sort it by date. And I am going to hand it over to Sierra for questions. Do we have any questions? Yeah, well, we have some good comments and some good questions. Um, one of them was, how do you feel about getting the company to pay for threat source news feed versus doing those presentations to management yourself? I think that that's probably one of the areas of threat intelligence feeds being highly effective. Um, if you're talking about a technical implementation of threat intelligence feed, I think it's complete crap. Uh, the reason why I think it's complete crap is because, you know, if you're trying to learn what attackers are doing to develop your defenses, um, we know what attackers do. They're going to send a spear fish, somebody's going to click a link, they're going to get compromised, bad guys are going to pivot, they're going to establish command and control. Dead simple, right? However, if you subscribe to threat intelligence feeds, like FSISAC and all the different ISACs that are out there, some of them are free, you get these narratives many times that are tuned for your specific market vertical, and you can actually have stories about your specific market vertical, about organizations being compromised and insurance not being paid out. That's part of like that visceral learning uh, about what is happening in such a way that it's not necessarily touching the frying pan, but it's watching somebody else touch the frying pan and learning from their mistakes. So yes, I think there is value in getting those news feeds. Yes, uh, next question. Uh -huh. Okay, so Bob said, did you hear about the recent Southwest Airlines claim against AIG trying to use their cyber policy due to a failed router? Um, I have not read that specific story. Um, as I said, once I got into this, I found lots and lots and lots of stories, and uh, there's plenty of them out there. So I know I haven't had any time to actually read up on that one at all. Uh, Marlon said, if you use a third-party PCI DSS to handle your payments, do you still have to do the same responsibilities with the insurer? Um, yes, um, because the PCI DSS, there's a specific component associated with PCI DSS, that's your PCI zone, right? And you're going to allow somebody else. That's a good example of deferring the risk to a third party. However, whenever you get cyber liability insurance, the cyber liability insurance is for things that may not be associated with PCI DSS. So those are your day-to-day -day operations. I don't know exactly what business you're in, but, uh, but almost all businesses will want to have some type of cyber liability because security doesn't begin and end with PCI. There are a lot of other things associated with computer security. You may be dealing with PHI, PII, personally identifiable information. There may be state requirements upon that as well. So many times just to do business, you want to have some cyber liability insurance and that's what you're going to do to actually implement those security policies and procedures. So an example would be if you're getting management pushback saying we don't need to do all these security things because we have a third party PCI uh, processor. You can come back and say for our cyber insurance, we do have to have those things because there's a lot of those components of a good security policy that are independent of PCI completely. Um, also, this is also hard. This is one of those things where it can get really, really wonky very, very quickly. If you go and you try to file a claim and you're a company that is dealing with credit cards and even if you are using a third-party PCI DSS vendor, right, to handle that, uh, or processor to handle that, then the insurance company may come back and say, no, you actually do accept payment. We don't care that you're using a third party because we require organizations that are dealing with credit card data, even if they're having a third party handle that data, to still be assessed and adhere to those standards. It's insane in some situations, but yes, you can see insurance companies still try to leverage that against you to try to wiggle out of paying anything. Good question. Um, and then from Jordan, there was a comment, more a comment, uh, that said, I love the idea of insurance as motivation, more motivation for HIPAA. Uh, jail time usually for willful negligence and even bad PR, which I think, yep. you know, like this is going to bad PR so that it's really driven by like not even the insurance. Hopefully someday it'll be driven like any business. Hey, I'm hoping, you know, we, we've talked about it many times. I'm hoping that it becomes something that is, uh, it's just built into our architectures. It's just something that we do. 
Um, you know, it's like accounting. You have to have certain accounting practices just to do business. Hopefully, shortly we'll be at a point where we'll just have security just to continue to exist. But maybe well, I should. And I feel like the general public is more educated about security. They will demand more from the businesses they do business with. Yep. But someday. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, so Lee says, there's cases where you can't patch and update specialized systems. A CNC machine can cost $100,000 to $500,000, and the computer's running Windows XP, and the patch costs $500,000. So like, mm -hmm. what do you do in that instance? So understand that anytime you're dealing with any level of compliance whatsoever, it's not a matter of being 100% completely compliant. You're going to have situations where you're not compliant. What you need to do is you need to document that and say, look, we're fully aware that we have AS400 computer systems. We're fully aware that we have some Windows XP computer systems in our environment that are required for specific applications. However, you can put mitigating or compensating controls around those systems to reduce that risk. So what you can do is say, yes, we have an AS400 but it's in its own security enclave. The only way that you can talk to it is by talking to a jump host server to manage it directly. All of the application goes through a third tier, an end tier architecture middleware that communicates with the AS400 on the back end. Or you can say we only allow the specific ports that are required for our application to talk to the AS400. Um, there's lots of ways that you can mitigate that risk and put in compensating controls. And that's okay, because if you have an auditor and the auditor is any good, they'll understand that there's certain things you cannot fix. And in having those things that you cannot fix clearly identified and then having controls to mitigate that and reduce that risk, you've actually showed that you've addressed that risk in some fashion or another. And that's perfectly fine. You just got to know how to talk those things through. Um, Chris says, I have to wonder if any insurer is offering liability insurance for anyone caught hacking back, like the guy who shoots the burglar and gets sued for depriving the burglar of his livelihood. For example, if I embed macro, a macro that writes a little binary file that writes dev your random to dev SDA or Windows hard disk and they run it. Okay, there's a very bright line whenever we're talking about active defense. So we usually, whenever we're teaching active defense, we teach poison, not venom. A poison would be something the attacker has to come in and take. They have to violate warning banners, they have to violate um, acceptable use, they have to violate the law to get to. But at that point, there are lines that should not be crossed. If you're just getting location information and IP address information, this is a uh, Susan Clements, Jeffrey versus Absolute Software is the legal case that you can look up. Um, the the uh, uh, Judge Walters, I think was the name of the judge, uh, said it is one thing to identify a computer system's IP address or geolocation in an effort to track it down. It is another issue entirely to violate federal wiretapping and computer fraud and abuse acts in that process. What I'm saying on that and what that case says is what it, if you're just getting the information of the attacker, you're probably okay, like location. But if you're actually gaining access to their files, if you're actually starting to delete the contents of their hard drive, at that particular point, you have broke the law. The point is, just because somebody broke the law for you doesn't mean that you have authorization to break the law, gain access to their computer system. So getting IP address and geolocation information, probably okay. Completely wiping out their hard drive, less okay. Cool. Um, and the last comment was from Randy. Um, he said, I use Pawnee Express for... Pro for real-time vulnerability testing is that good to have to compile with comply with insurance? Um, it it is a tool. So understand that there's no such tool at all that makes you compliant. Okay, it's how you use that tool. So if you're using Pony Express to do vulnerability scanning and doing these types of attack. Uh, assessments, and then you're actually implementing a program to address those vulnerabilities, you're going a long ways. But that doesn't address the policies that you need to have in place, doesn't address the user acceptance policies, doesn't exist, uh, address user security awareness training. There's a bunch of things that it will not do. It's just one component. So look very closely, and if you want, look at the SANS 20 critical controls. There's so many other things there, other than just vulnerability management, that need to be looked at as well. But that is a tool, and it's one of many tools that will do that specific type of a compliance function, but it's just one part of a much bigger picture. Uh, yes, cool. Okay, well, thanks everybody for their questions. That's it. But we did get a lot of comments on your, your typos, so maybe next time. Oh, we'll maybe what I'll, they all found the typos. So maybe I'll send it to <laughs> of you they instead. Did. I, uh, is the spirit of Pesci, pants or no pants? Probably no pants for Pesci. Um, but I'll send this to, what I'll do is I'll send this to uh, a Sierra. She can fix my grammar because I'm an idiot. And then and, I can uh, take the blame. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, there we go. But yeah, I just basically wrote this out um, 
I, I, I totally, somebody's like typo bounties for stickers? No, we don't have that many stickers. Um, so um, we'll get this addressed and we'll get it out there for everybody. Thank you so much, everybody. This I'll has been recorded. Thanks, guys.